Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is Sabrina Paganoni. Today, it's May 26, 2022, and we are here for the weekly updates uh, about the Healy ALS platform trial. I see that people are joining from the waiting room, so thank you for joining. We'll give everyone a few more seconds to, to join us. And tonight, I'm here with our patient navigator, Alison Bullet. Great to be here with all of you um, and provide updates. I see people are still joining. I think we can go to the next slide. So, so as you know, in the trial so far, we have included five different drugs. The drugs are labeled as regimens, A, B, C, D, and E. And uh, they, they all have different names and different uh, mechanisms of action. They're all manufactured by different companies and the names and companies are listed uh, here on this slide. Now, the trial is a perpetual adaptive trial. I do want to mention that we're working hard to add the next couple of regimens. So by the time we're done uh, with uh, these uh, first few regimens, we will uh, again um, try to open as soon as possible the, the other uh, regimens that we are working on right now. So this is really um, kind of a, a pipeline to continue to have treatments available uh, and trial opportunities available. Uh, the, the trial itself is a six month randomized controlled trial, it's placebo controlled, but the uh, allocation to active versus regimen is very much favorable, meaning that we have many more people being assigned to active treatment compared to placebo. And then at the end of the six month placebo controlled trial, everyone who completes the regimen uh, will be eligible for an open label extension of that regimen, where they can uh, be assured that they are receiving active drug um, for, for several months. And so far, uh, uh, just by way of updates, for those of you who see many new names tonight, so I just wanted to share that for, for now we have essentially fully enrolled the first four regimens. That means that we already started testing these drugs in, 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 in the group of participants that you know, we, we were planning to test this in. Uh, so it's 160 people for every, um, every regimen. And we will have the results later this year. Now, uh, the one study that we have results of um, is regimen A. It was unfortunately stopped early for futility. That was obviously disappointing uh, because we, we wish that uh, regimen had a positive result. But in a way, that's also proof of uh, the efficiency of the trial where we have mechanisms for stopping regimens that are unlikely to help early. Uh, so that we can redirect resources to the other regimen. So the ones that are still um, sort of uh, completing and, and we um, look for the forward to have results um, from our uh, the regimens B, C, and D, and we will have results later this year. Instead, regimen E just started enrolling. So we are still actively enrolling and, and we still need to find all the 160 people for regimen E, uh, a regimen of three LOs. Next slide. So for regimens A, B, C, and D, we are going to share everything that we learned about these drugs very soon with you. We expect top line results um, over sort of late summer, um, uh, early fall, uh, and then full study reports by the end of the year. Now, why do we have sort of a staggered release of information? Well, uh, we will first release the results for A, B, and C because they started at the same time and, and D is trailing behind just by a little bit because it was started later. Uh, and then um, the, the reason we have sort of top line results first and then full study reports is because this, this trial is collecting a lot of very important information. And so because of that, it's a really a, a very large amount of data and volume of data, including a lot of biomarkers that need to come from external vendors, different labs that are contributing data. So uh, we will first release the top line results, which is really what matters. Essentially, by reviewing the top line results, we will be able to answer the question, is the drug safe and effective for ALS? And then all the additional details that are so important, but they're sort of um, additional, will be released in the full study reports by the end of the year. Next slide. And so, uh, 
that's about the first few regimens. But now we really want to complete enrollment in regimen E because that's you know important. We cannot even begin to um, really start thinking about kind of close out and, and release of results until we have enrolled everyone, all 160 people in regimen E. And so, so far we have um, had a great number of people who signed informed consent, a little over 60 and a little over 40 that have been randomized within the regimen E. So 42 individuals have been randomized within regimen E. That means that these 42 people started receiving either active drug or placebo within the regimen. And so I really want to thank you for continuing to, um, to support people uh, and their participation, or perhaps some of you are participating in regimen E. And, and we also understand that there's a lot going on in the ALS space. And so we want to continue to discuss things with you uh, because we understand there's also you know, drug approvals, changes in standard of care. Uh, but again, it's important that we also, as everything else happens around us, we continue to enroll in Regimen E um, so that we can, um, uh, again, we can learn more about this drug and whether it, it works for ALS. Uh, I do want to mention that we are planning a dedicated Regimen E webinar. Um, and I right now I forgot the date, but uh, we are going to send all the information um, out tomorrow. I think it will be posted tomorrow. We finally identified the date, I think. And so uh, we have um, our lead investigators, Dr. Sukovic and Dr. Lada will join us and walk us through what it means to be kind of, you know, what are the procedures that are actually uh, happening in Regimen E. We had a previous webinar about the science of trialos, and now we're going to walk you through uh, the steps of, of participation in Regimen E. So for anyone who is interested in, in participating or wants to learn more about the Regimen, please um, join that webinar. Next slide. And so these are the sites. Uh, every week we uh, open uh, at least one more. So we have 36 uh, currently activated for Regimen E. They're listed here. Next slide. Uh, obviously, you know, we also have more that are, um, you know, uh, about to, to start. So these are the other sites closest to activation. We basically activate them on a rolling basis. They have to complete different training and certifications. And then as soon as everything is uh, received, they can be activated. So these are the next in line, but we have more that we, uh, you know, we're going to work on uh, over the next few weeks. So we will continue to increase the number of sites that are available for this regimen. Next slide. And obviously, this is a lot of information, so feel free to go back to our website. Actually, uh, our website has a lot of information. You can see the QR code. You can see the link there. Uh, the, the, the website has a lot of information, including the list of participating sites. They, for example, you know, you can go there and see if your site is recruiting for Regimen E or not. If a site is recruiting for Regimen E, they will be listed as recruiting, as you can see the first example on the slide. If the site is active within the regimen, within I'm sorry, within the platform trial, but is not recruiting for regimen E yet, it, it will be shown as active non-recruiting. So for example, Penn State Hershey, great site. They've been very active in the platform trial for regimens A, B, C, and D. Uh, and and they're, a, they're not recruiting for E yet, but as you've seen in the previous slide, they're actually about to get activated. So as soon as they're activated, their status will change to recruiting, which means they're active not only in the previous regimens, but also in the new regimen that's, uh, that's recruiting right now, regimen E. Next slide. As always, uh, please feel free to contact Alison and Catherine by email or phone. Uh, we continue to have weekly webinars. We have the ALS link, which is our newsletter. So feel free to um, sign up for that. I see that Alison is kindly sharing in the chat some of the information to contact that are similar to the ones in the slide. And so again, uh, feel free to register for the webinar, sign up for the research newsletter and contact us anytime. And we do have a number of upcoming guest speakers. Uh, next week, I'm, I'm very, very excited to have have uh, Danny Hevert, who is the lead coordinator at our site at Mass General Hospital. Uh, I've been working closely with him for several months and, and really is a stellar coordinator. And we wanted to bring a coordinator uh, to these webinars because they are essentially the people at different sites. Every site has one or more uh, that really are the interface with the participants, with potential participants or, or families. And so they help coordinate, as, as the name says, they coordinate the, the, the study visits. So uh, when you go 
to an ALS clinic and you see your physician, uh, then the physician works with research coordinators who coordinate research visits, which happen outside of regular clinic times. And so that person is really key. And again, every site has one or more um, so to, to be able to schedule. So we, we got a lot of questions about, you know, so, sort of like, how do you make the first step? How do you um, make yourself visible to, to a site? And so uh, Danny will tell us kind of from his point of view um, how coordinators essentially help um, uh, with access uh, and coordination of all new participants or, or ongoing participants. And then the following week, we will have Honore and Natalie from Hospital for Special Care, another great site. Uh, and, and they are a nurse and, and coordinator uh, that work at the site and they will share their perspectives. Again, every, and, every sites can be very different. In fact, we had many different site PIs here. You can watch the recordings. They presented their own sites. And they, they may work a little bit differently, depending on geography, local regulations, or, or just the way they run their clinic. And so um, you know, their nurses or coordinators uh, may interact uh, either by phone or email, depending on their preference. And so again, we'll, we'll have a series of these um, uh, meetings with coordinators and nurses so that you can learn more about the process of enrollment. And then I'm particularly excited that on June 16th, we will have Mr. Bruce Rosenbaum, uh, who is another member of our patient advisory committee. Uh, and actually specifically, uh, he helps us with the EAP. We have two patient advisory committees, one for the platform trial itself, and one for the EAP companion or expanded access companion to the platform trial. And we had Nadia Seti, who was wonderful here uh, last week. And, um, you know, was a, um, is, she's one of the members of the patient advisory committee to the platform trial. So we also wanted to bring in uh, a member of uh, the EAP patient advisory committee. So um, again, uh, join us for these webinars. And, and next slide. Just a reminder uh, that we continue to invite guest speakers. Feel free to send us questions and ideas. And also a reminder of the link for our uh, Trialos uh, Science webinar, uh, which is a great uh, recording and kind of prep for the new webinar that we're going to have soon in two or three weeks about um, Regimen E specifically. So with that, I think we can stop sharing slides and, and start taking questions. Hey, we did have some questions that came in for you. Um, Dr. Paganoni, is a diagnosis of possible ALS an exclusion criteria for regimen E? No, for this uh, trial, for, for the platform trial in general, uh, we are targeting a, a broad population, uh, certainly broader than many other clinical trials. And so the category of possible ALS, uh, which is a really a research sort of nomenclature type of, you know, it's the, that's based on some research criteria and that's included. So yes, you can be in the trial with a diagnosis of possible ALS. Wonderful. So if there is a person who is a slow progressor and can still walk and talk and work and all those kinds of things, so they're not eligible for trials because they're a slow progressor, are they able to enroll in open label extension? Well, you will be eligible not so much for the open label extension, but actually for the expanded access program. So to, to clarify, the open label extensions I mentioned earlier, they're an integral part of the platform trial. And it's only open to people who completed their regimen in the platform trial. And that's because th those open label extensions are, um, you know, it's a, sort of a continuation of the platform trial itself, where we continue to collect important safety mm -hmm. marker and clinical data that sort of augments, uh, they, they augment the, the, the data that's collected in the, in the regular trial. Expanded access options are separate. So we do have an EAP companion to the platform trial. It's not part of the actual platform trial. It's sort of a companion to it. It's, it's done in parallel. And that's much broader in terms of eligibility and does not exclude slow progressors. Thank you for that clarification. So with the recent FDA approval of the oral suspension of radicaba, can you talk a little bit about um, if participants can start taking that as an infusion during participating in the trial or if they need to wait until the open label extension period? Yeah, no, thank you for the question. We are actually actively reviewing this with multiple stakeholders. There are a lot of considerations that go into this. So I would ask you to, if you don't mind, uh, ask us the question again uh, next week or the following, because again, I, I expect the final, final decision on this very soon. 
in general, uh, you know, we, we have a commitment to allowing people to use standard of care medications when they are in the trial. That said, it's much better if people start receiving it before entering the trial. And the reason for that is because otherwise it would affect the results and it could potentially um, kind of uh, go against our ability to see a positive treatment effect if there is one. In other words, we're doing the trial to, to, to figure out if TLOs works. And if we have people starting Radicava or Rilusol for that matter, at all different times during the trial, we may not be able to see a positive effect even if the drug works because there's too many confounders. So um, ideally, if people can start before, that's definitely preferable. Uh, the exact mechanics of when to start oral radicava for people who are already in the trial. If you don't mind, why don't you ask us um, next week or the following? Oh, I'll write that down as a reminder for next week as well. Um, have any of the drugs in the platform trial been studied in other countries or been approved in other countries already? Not approved. Uh, there are some of these that have been studied in other countries, uh, not some for ALS in ALS trials and, and some in other indications. So for example, Verdiprestat has been studied in a, in a large trial in, in a form of Parkinson's disease, that's regimen B. The clean drug uh, has been studied both in multiple sclerosis and ALS, both in the US and elsewhere. Uh, they had an Australian study. Um, and uh, Zelucoplan has been studied in um, myasthenia gravis in a large study. Um, and uh, predopidine is being studied in a Huntington disease trial, again, in many, many different locations. Um, so it depends. So the, uh, each of them has been tested in different diseases and in different locations, including international, but they're not approved. Thank you. Do you anticipate that any of the drugs in the trial, in the platform trial, will be labeled for use only with a specific subset of patients? No, that would not be my uh, expectation. In fact, we are developing drugs that would be applicable to all forms of ALS. Now, obviously, it's you know, possible that when we get the results, we may see that the effect is really only in a certain subgroup. But um, again, so far, um, we don't have that indication and, and we'll see when we get there. But my expectation would be that this will be broadly applicable. Perfect. Now, separate from the platform trial, a couple of questions that have come in. Do you have any information on the um, new form of radicava when it will hit the market? So obviously that's a question for MT Pharma. Uh, I, I would say that our clinic has been in close contact with them. Um, and so we, we have a process um, for ordering it. Uh, I, I, my expectation is that in June, it should be available. Uh, now, whether people can get access to it right away or not will depend on their insurance uh, because there will still be a process for insurance um, review. So it's possible, for example, that if people, um, you know, were already on intravenous and they're just switching, it may be faster. But again, all of these will, will you know, remains uh, to be seen. Um, again, I think the drug will be available in June. It's just a question of when can people access it based on their insurance. Okay. Dr. Pagano, do you have any update on the AMLET situation at this time? No, we're still waiting for um, for FDA um, um, decision. Uh, and actually, I know that there's some um, kind of letters that are going around sponsored by the ALS Association. So if you, um, you know, feel free to check out the ALS Association website and other advocacy groups' websites to see what type of advocacy you can um, be involved with. And I know that there are a number of other um, Treat, potential treatments that people are interested in, such as NP001 and a new gene therapy. Um, are you hearing anything about those or have any information on anything new that's coming to the forefront? So, um, I mean, I I know that the, you know, there's been a recent paper of NP01 um, and, and hopefully the company, you know, kind of got restructured and hopefully they'll be able to move it forward. So I, you know, I'm hoping to see a new trial, but it's not available right now. And, um, you know, our great colleague, Dr. Hande Ozegler, uh, you know, I know she's doing great work uh, on many fronts. And so, um, you know, I hope that, uh, you know, her work will translate into human studies soon. So jumping back to the platform trial, are foreign-based drugs allowed in the platform trial? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. In fact, some of these are developed ex-US. Uh, okay. Some of these companies are based elsewhere, uh, specifically uh, Prilenia uh, is an Israeli company. 
and um, uh, the Leucoplan was originally developed by Rav Pharma, which was in the US, but it was then um, acquired by UCB, which is a company from Belgium. Um, back to the platform trial again, can you explain how soon would a participant get trehalose if they were on the placebo originally? What do you mean? Uh, I like, think, um, like, how many months will they be on placebo versus before they get into that open? Oh, I'm sorry, space? yes, six months. So this is the, the shortest possible duration for ALS trials. Uh, many other trials have a longer duration, so we really try to minimize the time on placebo, and that's uh, six months. And then there is the open label extension. Okay. okay, I think actually, Dr. Pagnoni, you have answered all of the questions that we got today. But certainly if there are any more questions that come in, feel free to reach out to myself or to Catherine and we'll, we'll get them on the list and answer them next week. Great, fantastic. Thank you so much and thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye.